Uh, my name is Sri Sriyal, and uh, I'm the current uh, president of the this organization, the Canadian Peace Research Association. We met last year at Carleton uh, University. Oh, okay. Carlton, yes, Carlton, yes, Carlton yes. University. Because we go wherever the Congress tells us to go. And next year, the Congress will be meeting um, in New Brunswick, uh, Fredericton, Canada. And uh, probably, you know, when you look at the size of the conference, like our meeting, to give you an idea, you think it's a very small meeting. It is a small meeting here. But the Congress has over 10,000 registrations. And it's scattered because there are 66 organizations which are organizing it. So some may have huge attendance, some have very small attendance. And um, ours is a typical story of uh, many, many years ago, I was less to be person speaker um, selected by the Foreign Minister of, well, the Foreign Minister's Committee of Canada. Uh, they have uh, each year Lester B. Pearson speaker on Prime Minister Pearson's birthday in India, 23rd of April. And one of the talks I gave, um, there are a number of talks uh, which are given, but one I gave at the University of Delhi, which was chaired by the Vice Chancellor, which is the University President. And there were only 23 people there. And so I was moaning, you know, saying, well, you know, it's a very small attendance. So the Vice Chancellor, who is a physicist, told me, Professor Duyal, when he was the first new graduate, like Roger, he had a student at Cambridge University. This white in the Delhi University Vice Chancellor gave me the story. Back in September, the both Oxford and Cambridge published the speakers for the year. So Joseph Needham, the Nobel laureate in physics, was coming on a certain day in October. And this guy was so excited, he signed up. He thought there will be hundreds and hundreds of people because Needham name is world renowned, you know, especially in the 50s uh, when he was at the height of his academic career. And uh, Professor Jial, would you please, when the actual talk was given, it was this, the would-be vice chancellor of Delhi University, the speaker, the Nobel laureate, and one more. <laughs> she said, don't feel that. Don't feel that. If you had 23, that's a very good number. So this is the story of number of academic. Uh, I presented a very good research paper many years ago at the Canadian Book of Science Association. And it showed 2,000 registrations. The panel in which I presented, we were five panelists and three audience <laughs> in this congress. So this, this is a typical story. With that, I'd like to welcome you. and. My first regret is that Dr. Abu Bukhari, who was to chair the meeting here this morning, he is still in Malawi. He was hoping to be in Canada by the 20th of uh, May. Uh, uh, Abu is our treasurer, but uh, his work would not allow him to leave until the 6th of June. 6th mm -hmm. of June, he is returning. Um, he got. Uh, you know, Abu, uh, that 3.2 million <coughs> from my, when I was at the University of Vagina, uh, Abu got 3.2 million dollar grant uh, to carry out a research project in Malawi, and which is a three year project, five year project. So he sent an email just about uh, probably six or seven days ago that uh, there's no way he can come. And also that even to get email for him is difficult to respond to email because uh, many years ago I had this, um, uh, we had a participant from uh, uh, one of the ex-Soviet uh, Union countries and uh, he said, uh, he was coming to make a presentation and he said, uh, I have to send everything through regular air mail because he cannot print out the email emails he receives. He has to go to 60 miles by bus to get the print, to get it printed. So those are practical problems. So I wish to express my regrets that Abu is not able to make it. 
The second is that some of you may have the older uh, copy of the program. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Donia Munsef, our secretary, and Donia sitting next to me. She appears uh, just before the program, just before Thursday, June the 3rd. Uh, those who have corrected copies, corrected copies were issued on the 4th of May, and uh, the corrected copy is also on the website of the Congress. So the Congress has posted it since the 4th of May. And Dr. Donia Munsep uh, is Associate Professor of Drama at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada, and her presentation will be uh, court of the piece poetry and protest, unquote. So this, uh, in, if you happen to have an older copy, this uh, uh, edition needs to be made. So where is she going to be now? This afternoon, 3.30 to 5. Oh, okay. And you know I'm here in the morning, is that it? Uh, I might have that all in the program now. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. Do you have the old one or do you want? Oh, I well, I have that. someone here who's associate professor of drama at the University of Alberta. Yes, that's not you. Peter Frank. Oh, okay. Oh, that's yeah. So with that, uh, I'd like to invite you, and we should begin. And our first uh, presenter is Dr. Pete uh, DeFry. Am I pronouncing? Yes, you're doing very well. Or, thank you. Associate professor of drama at the University of Alberta, Edmonton. His topic is twice at peril, genocide and its fictionalization. Um, Pete uh, is the director of graduate studies, uh, um, the PhD program. Um, he is both the director as well as, of course, a scholar. Uh, so director of graduate studies in the drama department. And um, um, I think he will explain a little bit more about uh, Bashir Nashar. Yeah, I mean, I, I just gave a little intro there to what I do. I do I both direct theater as well as uh, do quality work, critical work, and I just directed an award-winning production of something which may be relevant here. Uh, Evelyne de la Chenelier, Quebec author, playwright, wrote Bashi Lazar, which is the story of an Algerian immigrant to Canada, which of course has a lot to do with uh, peace studies. That's just won uh, some awards, which is wonderful. <laughs> And then I also do critical studies, um, and I'm presently involved in two big research projects. One is um, on uh, the cultural uh, impact of uh, Patrice Lumumba, the first Prime Minister of the Congo, who was assassinated in 1961. And I look at you know, the, the relevance of that figure in uh, cultural discourse. Um, and then my second project is has to do with this, and it's on the fictionalization of Rwandan genocide. Okay. Thank which you. Is a big, big, big thing. So, just before uh, Dr. Defry presents it, let me just also say that Dr. A. O. Adigun and Professor Mulachi Igvilo, uh, one is from the Department of Business Administration, the other is Center for Foundation Education, Bell University of Technology, Ota, Ogun State, has been denied visa to enter Canada. Um, therefore, they are not here. And after that, Abram Wiesfeld will uh, make his presentation, and Dr. Rose Dyson will make uh, her presentation, and then uh, hopefully we'll have some time for discussion. And uh, later at 11.45, we'll take a break for lunch uh, on our own. And then in the afternoon, hopefully all of us can gather here and others will join us. Uh, for Senator Gravel's uh, presentation. He will be introduced by Dr. Roger Dickman. And then there's a reception in honor of uh, Senator Gravel, and uh, the reception will take place right here. So just uh, to keep you informed until uh, 2.30. So with this, if I could request uh, Professor DeFry to uh, begin with this presentation. Thank you. I will have to apologize because this afternoon I actually fly to Brussels to execute some of the research, so I will not be uh, at, at the reception this afternoon. 
Um, I'll, I'll first do a very quick presentation of the general field in which this fits. Uh, and I say fictionalization of the Rwandan genocide. Um, I'm talking about all kinds of cultural discourse uh, on uh, that event, which happened, as you know, in 1994. Um, and one of the most obvious sources um, of such discourse on the events is, of course, the legal discourse. We have the famous Arusha trials uh, in uh, Tanzania, uh, which have been published, uh, that is actually available. Um, we have a fragmented uh, discourse on the Gagacha uh, village tribunals, um, I'm not sure whether I pronounce that correctly, which are these um, sort of grassroots tribunals in Rwanda itself, in the villages itself, where perpetrators of the genocide are tried uh, by, the, by the village itself. And then we have a whole a series of trials in international uh, courts in different countries, uh, which are administered through some kind of special law, a very famous um, uh, trial of that sort uh, took place in Belgium uh, with Maria Kitito, which has always also the project <coughs> of a play. And then more recently, um, Desiree Munyaninza was uh, convicted here in Montreal uh, of uh, <coughs> crimes against humanity back in uh, Rwanda. Um, apart from the legal discourse, there's also a lot of witnessing. Um, and one of the, the, the most important ones, of course, is journalism. Uh, I, I isolated one particular document in that, uh, in that uh, genre, um, and that is Jean Hatsfield Machete Season, which is a translation. He's a journalist in Paris who uh, compiled a book, and I think I have it with me here, compiled a book of uh, witness, witnessing of the perpetrators, in other words, of the killers of the genocide, which is, of course, very rare uh, that that is happening. It's almost an unreadable book. Uh, and so that's a very important one, uh, originally in French, this is the English translation. Um, and then of course there's all kinds of uh, reportage and document, uh, documentary, um, which have been published, a couple of examples are there. Autobiographical accounts, uh, people telling their own story, as it were, uh, of surviving uh, and dealing with uh, the genocide, um, a very famous one, of course, that most of you know it's Romeo, there's an old missing there, the layers shake hands with the devil, the failure of humanity in Canada. So that's uh, some kind of an autobiographical account <coughs> of the Rwandan genocide. So I, I, I look at all these genres to see, and, and I mean that's part of my much bigger research project, to see what the genre itself does to generating discourse on the genocide. Um, also a film on Romeo Dallaire's um, um, experiences uh, by Peter Raymond, Shake Hands with the Devil, The Journey of Romeo Dallaire in 2004. Mm -hmm. All kinds of documentaries uh, of the genocide in uh, Rwanda, there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, and then of course there's scores of uh, political histories uh, on the Rwandan conflict. I, I just uh, take one of them, Gerard Cunier probably the most famous historian writing on the, the genocide, the Rwanda crisis, history of genocide. Uh, and that's again the translation from the French original. There's also, uh, I also consider that a sort of, a certain kind of discourse, uh, and that is what I would call memorialization or monumentalization of the event. Uh, we typically thought the, the equivalent would be Auschwitz, right? That is a good kind of monumentalization of the Holocaust. Also in Rwanda, there are all kinds of monuments and, and um, representations um, of the, what took place there in 1994. There's also a lot of artistic responses to the event. Uh, many, many songs, a lot of music that um, responds to, uh, uh, memorializes uh, what has happened there. Lots of drawings, paintings, sculpture. Uh, we have need the rest of the day to show you all kinds of examples of that. Poetry, lots of performance, uh, and also lots of plays. I'm 
going to talk about one particular today, radio plays, novels, film, travelogues um, about um, um, the genocide. Um, in terms of dramatic plays, which is more or less my specialty, as it were, um, I um, singled out one particular play to talk about today. It's probably the most successful uh, piece of discourse, non-film, because the most successful uh, discourse is on the Rwandan genocide. And with successful, I mean popular impact. <laughs> uh, or, of course, film, for understandable reasons. And I'm sure most of you probably know most of the Rwandan, gen uh, the Rwandan conflict through film. Uh, but, um, and I have a lot to say about that genre uh, of film. Uh, and today I'm, I'm actually going to concentrate on, on the theatrical place. Uh, and I'll explain why in a second. Right. Um, there are many of these performances based in Rwanda itself which are difficult to access. So first of all, they, a lot of them are in Kenya and Rwanda, which I do not speak. I understand a little bit. I have been in Rwanda, by the way. I went on a long, big, big, big long uh, bicycle trip through Rwanda. Uh, it was the adventure of my life. Um, so in other words, I have uh, quite a strong association with, with the country and also have established friendships there. Uh, and that's also when I learn a little bit of the Kenya Rwanda language. So in Rwanda they speak, the, 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 the local language is Kenya Rwanda, uh, and the, the language of governance was French until the conflict. And of course since the, um, uh, the RPF uh, took over the government, that language of governance has shifted to English. Uh, so on, linguistically the country is actually very, very interesting. What, have, what is happening there. There's a massive, massive transition from French to English in the entire country. Uh, I can't think of any other example where that is happening so quickly and so radically as what is happening in Rwanda. So in terms of what is happening culturally, and we can even use the word genocide there too, that is still reverberated on a cultural level, on a linguistic level. <coughs> there are a couple of Rwandan playwrights there. Again, I'm, I'm not going to uh, go too much into them. Uh, an, an interesting project that I want to single out is uh, the Belgian uh, troupe, uh, group, group of from the age in Belgium, uh, that established the um, four hour play called Rwanda 94, Rwanda uh, 1994. Um, and they went on an international tour, also here in Montreal, with this four-hour four play. It's a very remarkable project. It's also available on film, and it, uh, it has been published in a book form. Um, I think it's actually the most interesting cultural discourse on Rwanda that has been produced, um, because they approached the subject in a non-representational way. Of course, I don't need to tell you that the crucial question is, how does one talk about genocide? Right. So, how does one do it? And, and we'll talk about it in a second as to one particular dramatist has done this. Konya Linden, an American playwright, uh, also wrote quite a successful play, Eric Keen, also Maria Pizzicchi. <coughs> it has been translated in many languages. This is the play on the nun, the Catholic nun, uh, Maria Pizzicchi is her real name, that um, first harbored uh, 500 uh, refugees in Rwanda, most of the Tutsis, and then distributed gasoline to the Hutu rebels to actually burn the church in which she had harbored those victims. Um, Eric Kane wrote a play about her um, and tried to sort of get into her psyche what led her to do that. Uh, very, very interesting play, uh, which again tries to go away from uh, realistic representations um, and enter more into uh, what I would call symbolic and allegorical language to talk about the conflict. Um, what I will talk about mostly today is J.T. Rogers' The Overwhelming. That is, I think, undeniably, in terms of audience, the most successful play that has been produced, has been done at the National Theatre in London, 
uh, in 2006, uh, which is not nothing because it's difficult to sort of get your play uh, produced there. He's an American playwright. The play was first done at Salt Lake City, but then has since been done in New York, uh, again in Salt Lake City, in London, as I uh, mentioned, and also in New England. So a very successful play. I'll come back to it in a second. Catherine, if you do, Lincoln's House is another one can earn in the sense of ending, um, which has not been produced. Lots of films, many films, some of them you know, you'll recognize, probably mostly Hotel Rwanda, right? Uh, I think the, uh, there's also a Canadian film in there, Sunday in Kigali, after the novel of uh, Robert Favreau, uh, and the motion of the Daphne Kigali. The most successful film, I think, uh, is probably Sometimes in April by Raoul Peck, and a director who I know from my other research because he also wrote or did a very interesting film on the Mumba. Um, one of the few African-based uh, film directors who actually took the subject of the one on the other side. Lots of novels, uh, I already mentioned Dimoja Arabicina Kigali, uh, in many different languages, which is also interesting of course, uh, and many of these have been translated some of these uh, uh, novels have also been turned into films. That's a Belgian Dutch uh, novelist. <coughs> then there are travelogues, right? Very famous one is We Wish to Inform You That Tomorrow We Will Be Killed With Our Families by Philip Gurevich. I conclude here uh, by showing a couple of built pictures, I mean, conclude the introduction. <laughs> Uh, a couple of pictures of the overwhelming. Uh, this is uh, the Utah uh, Salt Lake City production. As you can see, this is at the beginning of the play, this is one of the opening scenes. Uh, as you can see immediately, uh, what you have in the play is a very realistic aesthetic. So, actually, this features in the tradition of what I call American realism. Uh, I mean, this, for all, I care it could be, you know, Edward Albee or George Gordon Shaw, for that matter, uh, which is interesting. This is how to join the London production. Uh, again, uh, a very realistic production. In fact, when I saw this picture on the left here, um, it reminded me of, of one of the churches that I visited in Kigali when I was on my bicycle trip. And, uh, And this is the roundabout theater production in New York. Interesting scene here, interesting shot. I will talk about this particular scene in the play where uh, Carol, who is in the middle of the picture, um, who is the partner of an American professor who goes to Kigali to do some research during a sabbatical, goes to the market in Kigali and buys a cabbage from a woman uh, to the right here. Um, and she is denied buying the cabbage, or advised buying the cabbage from the man on the left, because she is a dirty Tutsi. Mm. You don't buy cabbages from dirty Tutsi, you buy them from the Hutu woman uh, a little further on. Um, and I think it's a very crucial scene in the play, because of course, as some of you will know, uh, one of the metaphors uh, that was, or, 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 um, avoidance words really that was used to denote what was happening is that, that Tutsis were called cabbages and they had to go and cut the cabbages in yeah. the dark. Um, so this is a, a quite a crucial scene where I think J.T. Rogers transcends the, his own limitations of realism in a kind of uh, roundabout way because of course what you, what you see is very real, it's a real cabbage, right? <laughs> uh, Another thing they were called, of course, were um, cockroaches, right? So uh, cabbages and cockroaches were the two euphemisms to be able to talk about what was really happening. I'm going to my uh, notes here, because now um, I'll talk about um, a little bit more the overwhelming itself. And for that purpose, I'm going to start with a scene um, to read a scene in the play, 
actually before I do that, let me talk about the basic plot of the play. Um, the central figure in the play is Jack Exley. He's an American professor of political science who has trouble getting tenure. Uh, his book isn't ready. His first application for tenure was rejected, and he's got an extension. And uh, now he's also a sabbatical and has studied together with a Rwandese doctor uh, when he was doing his graduate studies, uh, his PhD studies. Rwandese doctor, meanwhile, has gone back to Kigali, to Rwanda, and he's lost touch with him. But two months before he was due for the sabbatical, which was you know, the final verdict for, for, for his tenure, that sabbatical, in which a book had to be produced so as to get tenure, the Rwandese doctor re-emerges and writes him and asks him for help in terms of, the, in terms of research, mostly in terms of spreading the word of what is happening in Rwanda. And this is well before the conflict, by the way. This is uh, in 1993. Um, he jumps on the occasion. He jumps on, on what is offered there, this American professor, Jack Exley, uh, and decides to go to Rwanda and to <coughs> shadow this doctor who is working in an AIDS project in Kigali. And uh, I, I feel like I've personally witness that AIDS project because I've, I've seen a, a, a huge big AIDS project being developed in Kigali when I was there on my bicycle. Um, but once he arrives in Kigali, the doctor has disappeared. Big panic uh, for two reasons. Well, his friend, the doctor, has disappeared. But secondly, he won't be able to write his book. He won't be able to get his tenure. He's there with his... Uh, girlfriend who is a black African woman. So that adds an interesting racial discourse because the professor himself is, is white. Uh, so he's there with his partner who is a black African woman and his white son from his first marriage. Who of course, needless to say, he's a 17 year old or 16 year old. He gets initialized sexually uh, in Kigali uh, where sex is readily available as I personally witnessed too. Um, of course, through money, through exchange of, of money. Um, the doctor reappears towards the end of the play and looks for shelter in his house, in the professor's, the white professor's house, but is basically betrayed by both his son and by his partner, his Afri African American partner, Linda is her name. Uh, and then finally by himself. Uh, and that is the end of the play where uh, two uh, Rwandese officials force their way into the house with <coughs> both machete and gun and claim the doctor who sought refuge or shelter in the American professor's house and Jack Exley finally yields him and shouts three times, take him, take him, take him, because he obviously can't stand the pressure anymore of the violent threats all around him. His son, by the way, was being threatened by the invading people so as to yield uh, the doctor to them. And the curtain closes. We know what's going to happen. We know that the doctor is going to be cut is going to be killed. Uh, but we never see any real violence in the play. Incidentally, this is also one of the main reasons why the play was called one of the best plays to be produced ever on violence. Uh, and I have many, many reviews here that I can quote from, for instance, the London National Theatre production that uh, laud the play. And mostly there's a reference to the fact that we never really get to see the violence on the stage, but we always have a sense that it is there. We actually get to understand it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which I found interesting. Uh, and this is in great contrast to the films, of course, where violence uh, is inevitably uh, reenacted, sometimes also documented, not the violence itself, but the effect, because in many, many films, it is actually sometimes authentic footage of the bodies uh, on the side of the road, which I find 
ontologically again disturbing for other reasons. And of course, there's buckets of blood in film uh, so as to re evoke um, uh, that particular fluid. Uh, here in this play, we don't see any of that. Uh, in fact, on only two occasions in the play, we see it some arms, either a machete or a gun, uh, which is again interesting. I'll read um, a little scene from the second act in the play where the American professor, Jack Exley, talks with a South African peace observer from an NGO who is there to document uh, some of the human rights of Um, Jack, who saw this? Who told you this? For big, some Unamir boys. Unamir is the United Nations uh, observa uh, uh, yeah, observation of Lincoln at the time. <coughs> Wanted to pass on what they'd seen. One of the villages they went through, they found he stops as the waiter arrives with, with their drinks. Waiter goes away, then continues. About two dozen people killed. Jack. American professor of Tutsis, for big, the South African. That's what they were told. They said the men were cut up with machetes or had their heads cracked open with masseuse, these clubs with nails that you get the picture. The women had their Achilles tendons cut, so between rapings they couldn't run. Some of the women who were killed were pregnant, their stomachs were cut open. Jack, Jesus, who did it? For big, don't know. Hutu power, militias, government troops. But something is happening. <coughs> Jack, who are you going to tell? For big, I'm telling you, aren't I? Jack, but you have to put this in a report. People have, have got to know about this. For big, this isn't enough for, this isn't enough for a report. Jack, what are you talking about? For big first rule of reports, you get various sources and you get them confirmed. That's how you find a pattern. That's the only way your narrative makes sense. Jack, but you're not writing a fucking novel. You can't just bury this. For big, you want me to write this without proof? Jack, you can't pretend you didn't. For big, did I see it? Did you see it? Do you know what happened? Jack, <coughs> these are your end observers, for Christ's sake. Why would they lie? For big? Yes, 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 because everyone lies here. I'm lying to you right now, Jack. About what? For big? I'll let you know when I remember. He pours them a drink, each of them. Everyone lies here, Jack. You'll start too, if you haven't already. Mister, I'm not running away from anything. It's self-protection. The question while you're here is, why would this person be honest? Why would he risk that? Pointing to the bottle in front of them. You see how they always bring a fresh one? Unscrew it in front of you? Jack, yeah. For big, now we're supposed to take our first sip together. It's tradition, so we know there's nothing extra in there. Jack, poison? Are you serious? For big, you mean I'm lying to you? Interesting little passage. <laughs> I read it because it simply sort of summarizes the basic problem of this discourse on the genocide. Because inevitably, what we read, what we hear, what we see in film, in play, on the stage, in a novel, is actually lie. Because it's not what happened. I mean, this is obviously fiction, right? This is based on, on fiction. Uh, even a novel or a, a, a book like Machete Season, which is a collection of witness, witnessing of the killers themselves, is ultimately lie because the killers themselves have fabricated you know, some of their apologias, some of their reasons why um, they, they did the killings, etc., etc. So as we deal with um, reports and discourse on the genocide, we inevitably deal with lie. One of the more main problems of uh, <coughs> these um, discourses on genocide is the point of view. It's interesting that most of the examples that I've given in my first five minutes introduction are written or done by white 
Western based beat. This play too is written by a Western based white successful playwright. Right. The main character in the play too is a white Western based <coughs> fairly successful character. I mean, he needs to get his tenure. Uh, and we see this pattern repeated over and over again. Uh, we see it in a film like Hotel Rwanda, we see it in uh, a Sunday afternoon at a sw swimming pool in Kigali, uh, that this the point of view in all these witnessing stories and these narratives is white western based, which, which obviously inevitably uh, gets us to, um, how much time do you have? Yeah. Um, which inevitably let, lets us to um, a point of reference in which we hold whatever is being said as a white Western point of reference. In the play, there's something very interesting happening uh, that, as it were, supports this, but also complicates this. One of the most interesting things in the play is its language of the opponents. The play is polyglottic. There are four languages in this play on the stage. Most of it is in English. There's also French in it, quite a bit. And there's a lot of Kenya Rwanda in it. And then, sort of to add more spice, there's some Spanish in it. Now, in the play script itself, all these languages are translated. So I have no problem understanding what everybody is talking about. But of course, this does not work like that on the stage. Because when they talk Kenya Rwanda, most of the audience will not understand what you're talking about. Same with the Spanish, same with the French, unless you have that polyglotic experience. Effectively, what happens there is that the point of reference, the main language, is English. It's undeniable in the play because you know the setup of the characters, because of the way they talk, which itself is already a convention because in Rwanda at the time, in 1994, the language of discourse in the capital will be French, not English. Yet we do have some French in the play, as it were, to remind us of that. Now, that language disposition is interesting because the Kenya Rwanda, when they talk about the cabbages, and when they talk about the cockroaches, they do it in a language that is then very conveniently and apologetically not understood by the white people who are part of what is happening and on which so many of the victims have actually relied uh, against all odds, as we know now, at the time. <coughs> so Rogers, in an interesting way, as it were, reenacts that, <coughs> re-evokes those interesting language politics in the play. I think that's one of the biggest successes of the play. I'll conclude. The biggest failure of the play, I think, is that and of, of many of these plays, because he molds it into a narrative, and it's the narrative of this American professor who has to write his damn book in order to get tenure, there is inevitably a structure to be followed there. They call it sometimes in the review a political thriller. Excuse me, a political thriller on the Rwandan genocide it sounds a bit perverse to me. But it's an inevitable effect of trying to mold this into a narrative because the structure of narrative is brutal. It needs to respond to conflict and to some kind of resolution or as the case may be absence, re absence of resolution, but it still responds to that structure that the narrative wants. Now the genocide did not have a narrative. The genocide is by definition chaotic. So any kind of discourse that responds to it in a narrative kind of way is by, by necessity already a lying intervention, lying as in not speaking the truth, a lying intervention of the chaotic events that happen. And this play in particular, I think, uh, falls victim to that because of its very realistic uh, sort of salon interpretation of the events. Most of the scenes in the play happen in some kind of living room, 
which of course is not where the genocide was taking place. The genocide typically did not take place in, in the living rooms of Kigali. It took place everywhere in the streets, in the living rooms, yes, but also in the, in, in, you know, in public places, in the marketplace, what have you, what have you, in the swamps. It's difficult to represent that on the stage. I'll conclude here. Thank, Thank you. you. of Rwanda, I, I, I read many, many historical interpretations, political narratives, of, uh, political science narratives of what happened there. Uh, and of course, there is no agreement on where exactly the causes uh, lie. And one of the possible explanations might have been in uh, the colonial um, uh, exacerbation of racial difference. Versus Tutsis. Uh, it's a handy uh, explanation, right? Whether or not that is it or not. It's interesting in, in artistic responses that almost invariably it would be hard to find an exception. Uh, and then the overwhelming also, uh, we deal with mixed marriages. And Hotel Rwanda also, it's a mixed marriage uh, at the center of the uh, thing. Of course, between the the mixed love affair between the Montreal uh, journalist and his Tutsi uh, girlfriend. Uh, here too, I mean, the, 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 there's two mixed marriages. On the one hand, there's actually the white professor with his black American girlfriend, right? I think he got in his place, as it were. And then there's Dr. Joseph Gazana, who is himself uh, a Tutsi, but has married a Hutu. So I think to, uh, to a certain extent, uh, most of the artistic responses that I know go beyond those traditional explanations of the conflict. Because of course they are not satisfactory. I mean, it's, it's not because somebody is a Tutsi or Hutu that therefore all of a sudden you're going to take out your knife and kill close to a million people. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, there's some very interesting political science comments on, on that explanation, that it remains thoroughly, thoroughly unsatisfactory as an explanation. What can explain it is 
uh, again, the impact of language. Because uh, for years and years and years, and I actually witnessed that on my bicycle trip, uh, the radio, officially sanctioned radio, continuously talked to talk about the cockroaches and the cabbages that had to be cut. And I think there, there was an impact of cultural indoctrination that took place, I think, which comes a lot closer to the explanation of the conflict, rather than the racialization that took place on the whole of the time. I know that B does not happen without A. You need the racialization first in order to have that impact of cultural indoctrination. Harry? I'm Dr. Dufresne. Uh, I, I found your presentation to be fascinating in a number of different ways, uh, two of which I'd like to just raise with you. Um, you started, or at some point in your talk, you talked about how does one talk about genocide? And um, it ended somewhere with, uh, you know, with uh, a, a different question, in the sense that you answered, which was, where do we talk about genocide? You know, where, where do these conversations happen? And uh, it's so interesting you know, to talk about the conversations, perhaps through the plays and the fictional accounts happening in living rooms, uh, in this fictional space of security. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Very good. Yeah. Right. And so you have us. You know, and the theater. Right. Well, this is it, right? So here we are, you know, enveloped in a place where we can have these conversations about the most severe and extreme atrocities in a fictional space of security. Anyway, and that was sort of the. the subtext that I, that I found there um, and that I found interesting. Uh, the and that comes also for film, by the way, right? We, we watch these films in our living rooms on the DVD or in the film theater, and it's, we, the most unspeakable things are there, but we are very, very secure taking them in. And there, there is a sort of applicability to this attempt to circumscribe uh, threat uh, in time and in space and to, uh, you know, and, and I think it, it weaves in with your fictional, you know, discourse, your know, discourse on fiction. The other question was more a question. Uh, you talk about lies, and you use the language of lies, um, rather than the language of fiction, even though fiction was in your, uh, in your title. And I wonder how you distinguish between lie, representation, narrative, uh, you know, discursive positionality, um, and why you chose to really emphasize lies. Uh, what's the claim to truth? Right. Of course, fiction has no claim to truth. Right? That's one of the definitions of fiction. Uh, it's very interesting that during the Tudor regime in England, theater was actually forbidden because it lied. Theater was lies. And theater has to lie because when Hamlet is killed on stage at the end by Laertes, Hamlet is not killed. Because if Hamlet were killed, that's when we call 411, or 911 rather. <laughs> the ambulance and the police, right, to arrest liars. Um, and if we fail to accept, you know, that convention, which is a lie, uh, we cannot watch uh, what happens there. So it's a very, very interesting uh, situation we are in when we're watching these things. We know. As we, it, 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 of course, it, it plays more tricks in film than it plays in the theater. Because in theater, there is an embodiment. In other words, there's a physical presence. Which is also the reason why it's so much more problematic to represent violence on stage. But as in film, that embodiment is not there. Right? It's, it's on the screen, it's, it's celluloid, it's projected. But yet they can do all kinds of magical tricks to make us believe that what we see is actually happening in front of us, or at least that it is documentary. No. Of course, nothing is further from the truth. As I said, lots of buckets of red paint in film in order to produce the plot. But that too is obviously a lie. The lie I find mostly in the reconstruction of the event. And I would call it an unapologetic, audacious reconstruction, where we forget through the tricks of the narrative, through the tricks of all kinds of uh, technical uh, effects, right? the lights in the theater, the costumes, the set design, also in film, you know, the, the, the collage, uh, the workshopping of the film, that we forget that this actually is 
uh, a reconstruction. And, and because we forget, therefore, it is audacious and unapologetic. That was escaped a little bit by the group of uh, troops from Belgium in Rwanda, Katarman, Katars, uh, where all the actors, for instance, were permanently on the stage. And you saw them actually uh, uh, incarnate different roles. And then in the next scene, they incarnate a different, uh, still another role. So in other words, one, one was continuously reminded uh, that there was no effort to authenticate the actions. They were always reenacted. And I think when, when we can come there, we can come closer to um, a sort of understanding. It's problematic too, and I'll give you one example if I have two minutes left. Um, um, your time is <laughs> Yeah. There's a big project here in Montreal, the uh, Racine Ephemer. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Um, and that it's a project that uh, is, has received a lot of funding. We're talking about you know, millions of dollars. I think it's over a million dollars. Um, and it's between historians and artists. And um, for instance, one of the, the things that happens is all these historians have interviewed survivors of Holocaust, of violence, uh, the, the Chilean regime, the Rwandan genocide, the Bosnian conflict, et cetera, et cetera. They've interviewed them at length and videotaped them. And then these videotapes have been borrowed by uh, uh, a performance artist who had five actors watch them. And as I do here, I use gestures. So as they retell their story, they use gestures. And these five actors were given these videotapes to look at the gestures specifically. They didn't understand the French because most of these interviews were in French, because they don't speak French. And then they were asked to reenact the gestures which supposedly the ultimate effect of better understand the trauma of what these people went through. And then these gestures were actually reproduced on the stage, it's called Lamentations, uh, with songs of Jeremiah as a supporting sort of soundscape. And I've, I've watched it and I asked uh, the guy who did it, um, did the survivors see it? said, well, as far as I know, only one saw it. And I didn't have the chance to speak to her because she immediately left. And immediately I thought, what a huge dilemma for somebody who has this incredibly complex story of survival of a Holocaust, and then see that reduced to five actors Thank you. And, and, and as I said earlier, and Dr. Aligun and Dr. Bracci Niklo for the Bad Jewish and Technology could not get a visa from the Canadian High Commission, so they could not come here. And therefore, and so our next presentation is. Um, from Abram Wiesfeld. Abram, uh, should I say Dr. Wiesfeld now? <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> the University of Quebec at Montreal is doing everything possible to delay and delay and delay. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that Abram is winning in court, forcing the university to recognize what he has done rightfully. So Abram's topic, um, just before that, I should like to say uh, that um, Abram um, has completed his doctoral thesis at the University of Quebec at Montreal in political science. His thesis makes a critique of the Hegelian nation state of modern, modernism and was itself subject to an expulsion and reinstatement by the court's uh, decision here in Montreal recently. Formerly, uh, he was a lecturer at York University and was a well founder of the Parliament Hill Peace Group Peace Camp Protest during 1983 85. 
his topic is the Palestinian Israel impasse. Um, hopefully, you conclude in less than 20 minutes so that uh, the next speaker can come. And in each case, we have uh, 10 or 8 minutes for discussion. This, uh, this session will automatically conclude at 11.45 so that we can take a break at lunch, for lunch, uh, which is on your own. And please try to be back here by 1.15 so that we can hear Senator Mike yes. Revel. And uh, there's a reception in honor of the senator, which will take place right here at 2.30 p.m. And please be, do join the reception. So with that, uh, Abram, if I could request you to take over. Okay. Um, I need to say, I got to the deal, I can't say.